is the executive vice president of the uh, European Commission. Um, the session will la last for 45 minutes, and we uh, would like to solicit your questions. If you could send them uh, to us at bigideas at iea.org. Again, the email for the questions is bigideas at iea.org. And with this, I would like to turn the floor to the IA's executive director, Dr. Fatih Biro. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mouat, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for uh, all of you for joining us uh, today. I would like to welcome you to IES uh, Big Ideas Distinguished Speaker Series. Some of you uh, know we started this a few years ago. Uh, we started with Mary Robinson, the former president of uh, Ireland, and we had several uh, government uh, leaders, business uh, leaders, Nobel uh, laureates, uh, uh, thought leaders, and we discussed uh, several uh, different aspects of energy, climate change, and related uh, issues. Our last uh, guest uh, was uh, the, the Minister of Energy and Climate of uh, Canada, Mr. Uh, Oregon. But today it is a personally a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to welcome uh, Mr. Franz uh, Timmermans, Executive Vice President uh, of European Commission. Uh, good morning to you, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans, and thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, dear, thank you very much, sir. Uh, dear colleagues, I think uh, almost everybody knows, uh, I am sure, uh, Mr. Timmermans, but just to tell you that we know his uh, very uh, strong uh, presence and guidance is the uh, with the European Commission, but before that he had a very successful career in the Dutch government, including being the uh, foreign minister. And if I am not wrong, Mr. Mark Rutte, the current prime minister, was the prime minister at that time. He was serving as the uh, uh, foreign minister, very successful uh, period there. And uh, today's, of course, you cannot expect anything else. Uh, today's the topic of our discussion is the European Green Deal. What are the next steps? Uh, so uh, it is uh, uh, a European Green Deal. You may like it or you may not like it, but it put the stamp on the uh, international energy and climate uh, uh, debate. And uh, just today, uh, uh, we just heard that the uh, Japanese Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Suga, announced uh, Japan's uh, intention, target of bringing the emissions uh, to net zero by 2050. So this is all uh, going one after another. And uh, we have the real mind and the architect of the European Green Deal, uh, Mr. Uh, Timmermans. Uh, so therefore, uh, we are very uh, fortunate and I would say real mind and architect may be the guardian of the, uh, the uh, European Green Deal as well. He is guarding it very, very strong and pushing it uh, forward. But of course, uh, the, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans, when he started his job, uh, I'm sure he has not uh, 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 considered, or we, nobody knew, there was a COVID in the middle of the uh, uh, plans which changed all of our lives, our thoughts and so on. And uh, of course, it brought another, in my view, complexity for all the plans, including the European uh, uh, Green uh, Deal. When we look at globally, our numbers show that the, the global energy demand this year, because of COVID, will decline about 5%. What does it mean, 5% decline this year? Just to compare the decline after the financial crisis, 2008-2009, at that time the global energy declined as well, but this year's decline is seven times larger than the decline after the financial crisis, just to put the things in a context. Now, our main worry is, uh, of course, among other things, is the uh, emissions, and the emissions are declining, and according to our uh, World Energy Outlook, the European emissions this year went down to uh, 1950s uh, level. Again, global emissions decline as well. The issue is, the issue is how to see a, or avoid a rebound of emissions with the rebound of the economy, to put it simple. Because when we look at in the past, when the emissions declined, again after the financial crisis 2008, 2009, 2010, economic rebound of the world, 
emissions jump up strongly. How we avoid the uh, the rebound of the emissions? So I think the one of the uh, 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 best answers to that came from uh, Europe under the leadership of uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans. The IEA was the first uh, organization uh, the, in March, we said very clearly, the uh, green energy policy should be at the heart of the economic recovery. And many people and uh, uh, many organizations and the others follow the view are very happy uh, with that. And I was honored, I was very honored to have a, a joint op-ed with uh, Mr. Timmermans uh, uh, sometime uh, in uh, uh, March. And uh, we said that the, the recovery should focus on the existing, improving the existing clean energy technologies penetration, but also pave the way for the uh, innovation, including the uh, hydrogen. So uh, I would like to uh, talk with uh, Mr. Timmermans these issues also in a global uh, context. But uh, just to finish uh, my introduction, my unfortunately, my last visit to um, uh, Mr. Timmermans was uh, end uh, January. We promised that I, uh, we would uh, meet us uh, again, a long discussion. And when I left this uh, meeting, Mr. Timmermans' office, I thought we discussed many things, the solar, offshore wind, hydrogen, uh, Europe, China, uh, everything. But I had two important concepts when I left the Mr. Timmermans office. One, a man with a big heart for the public service. This is number one. And number two, which was a very good surprise for me. The first one I knew, but I, it was very strongly confirmed. Second, which was a surprise, but a very nice surprise for somebody like me, a man with a passion for football. So this was also very important. I saw the uh, the, the 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 jersey of the uh, Roma, the Italian uh, football club, together with his local team, Roda, of course. But uh, I was very happy to see that the uh, uh, Mr. Vice President uh, still keeps an eye on uh, football and his uh, uh, beloved team, uh, Roma, in uh, Italy. And uh, but of course, uh, leading Europe and also pushing the uh, global agenda for all of us to address the climate change in a timely manner. So, uh, 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 Mr. Timmermans, once again, thank you very much for giving us this uh, honor. And uh, perhaps I would uh, uh, suggest you to say a few words before I start the uh, question. We are also already getting some questions from our viewers uh, around the world. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Timmermans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol, and thank you so much for this wonderful kickoff. Um, uh, I'm really honored to be with you uh, today. Um, I want to start by thanking you for your leadership. I think the IEA, uh, IEA's World uh, Energy Outlook is really helpful in doing uh, what we need to do because it puts things into perspective. And, you know, we're in the middle, not just of a pandemic, we're in the middle, not just of a climate crisis, not just of a biodiversity crisis, we're also in the middle of an industrial revolution. And, and we have seen in, in, in human history that every industrial revolution is driven by and accompanied by a massive energy shift, a massive shift in uh, what energy uh, uh, drives it. And in that sense, this industrial revolution is no different from other industrial revolutions. I mean, we're, it's only a couple of years ago that we were seeing, uh, you know, the golden age of gas coming. And, and 10 years before, it was coal uh, that was uh, actually exploding as an energy source. And now we know, and, and it comes clearly out of your report, that uh, solar energy is likely to be the king of power generation uh, over the decades uh, to come. Now, the Green Deal we, we launched, uh, as you said before, we didn't launch it knowing that there was going to be a pandemic. Uh, but when the pandemic came, uh, the first reaction by some was to say, nice, it's really nice to have a Green Deal, but not for now, because we need to come out of this pandemic first, and then we can go back to the Green Deal. But fortunately, that only lasted very, very briefly. In the private sector, in the energy sector, and in, in politics, Everybody soon came to the realization that if we want to come out of this pandemic stronger uh, and if we want to avoid uh, pouring uh, billions and billions of euros in what, what are going to be stranded assets, 
we need to use the Green Deal as our growth strategy and our recover, recovery strategy uh, as well. Now, uh, in that context, we also had to uh, increase our ambitions for uh, emission reductions by 2030. It was set previously at 40 percent. Uh, we've set it now at 55 percent. Why? Because we knew that if we would stick to 40 percent by 2050, we would only have a reduction of emissions of 60 percent instead of climate neutrality, uh, which which is uh, our aim. Uh, so now we uh, had this unique moment in European history in July where the leaders of the nations came together and said, OK, we need to show some solidarity here because either we get out of this together or we sink individually. Um, and they mobilized up to 1.8 trillion of funds to invest in our economy uh, and our societies. Now, if we want to do that, we have to look both at issues that will lead us to climate neutrality in uh, 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 2050, but also issues that will help us overcome the crisis. So you have to have both long term positive effects and short term uh, positive effects. Uh, we also then, when we did our analysis of what was needed to get to minus 55, we understood that the three sectors um, where it will be most difficult uh, to uh, reach our goals are um, uh, transport, housing and agriculture. Um, industry is challenging. Everything is challenging. Everything is going to be very difficult. But industry is actually set better in a better position than households, transport and agriculture. So we will have to have some plans uh, to um, uh, reduce emissions there. That's why we've already launched what we call the renovation wave, which would uh, stimulate the renovation of existing housing across the European Union. That creates jobs immediately for small and medium sized enterprises, reduces emissions, improves air quality in cities and avoids um, the uh, 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 issue of a of energy poverty, which is, I think is a looming issue and something you have been uh, paying attention to uh, as well. Um, the transport sector will be difficult to abate. We need to stimulate um, uh, electric mobility for uh, 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 lighter vehicles, hydrogen mobility, fuel cells for heavier vehicles, for uh, also shipping and the airline industry. Um, so. Uh, as you said, hydrogen will play a role in this. Uh, uh, carbon capture and storage uh, linked with natural gas will play a role in this. So we have so many things uh, to do. But if I want to leave you with one thought, uh, uh, and my final thought on this, we can do this. It's, it's feasible. It's difficult. It's feasible. Two things need to be kept in mind. First of all, if we don't do this, it's going to be even more difficult. And we're going to lose, lose more money. And we're going to be confronted with a, a natural environment that is out of control, out of control. Uh, if we go beyond 1.5 degrees temperature already now with one degree increasing temperature, it's almost impossible to um, uh, mitigate everything and to 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 uh, uh, reduce the consequences of what's happening. Uh, look at the droughts, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to to go into that. So we need really to do this because the cost of doing nothing is going to be much higher than the cost of investing. And my, my second, uh, perhaps the most important thing is this transition will be just or there will be just no transition. We can leave no one behind in this, because if the feeling is that this is for the happy few, this is for the people who can afford it, then it will just not happen because the people who will be who will be uh, feeling left behind will stop it from happening. So I just very briefly gave you a short overview and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans. Now, uh, first of all, we are getting a lot of questions from the journalists and other viewers, but uh, I would like to start uh, first. Now, uh, the renovation wave, I think this is a very important project because we know that the government's uh, the single uh, duty is not only addressing the climate change, but also creating jobs and boost the economic growth. And I think the, uh, the as we have suggested in our sustainable recovery plan as well, uh, energy efficiency is a job creating machine. It creates jobs uh, a lot. So uh, what are the first thoughts, what impressions with the renovation wave you have uh, started, uh, 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 Mr. Timamas? Uh, are you happy with how, the, how uh, these ideas are transformed? 
Well, I have to say there is a huge enthusiasm across the European Union for this, especially cities all across the European Union are jumping on this uh, because they understand, you know, one of the effects of, 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 of COVID, uh, as you said, energy consumption has gone down and many citizens and cities uh, are aware that there can be cleaner cities. They, you know, they, they enjoyed the better uh, air quality. They enjoyed the, the quieter uh, situation and and they are pushing especially their mayors and local authorities for more bike lanes for cleaner public transport um, for more trees in the cities etc and as part of this they're also asking for better insulated houses for solar panels on the roofs for uh, uh, um, everything prepared for 5g connections in the housing etc and this is a huge opportunity especially for small and medium-sized enterprises because they are going to have to do all this work uh, uh, on the spot and it will lead to immediate results and a long-term result of um, of um, uh, emission reductions and and i have to you know just remind you that in europe every year 400,000 people die prematurely because of bad air quality you know improving the air quality has so many benefits not just for the uh, emission reduction but also for the improvement of of, of health and improvement of well-being Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Timmermans. Uh, Mr. Timmermans, a bit uh, uh, going uh, outside of Europe, because what you have done in Europe or what you are doing in Europe is very important. Uh, but uh, you and me also discussed that Europe is about 8% of the global emissions. We have to see others are also moving. First of all, I would like to uh, ask your uh, views about uh, China. I mean, China made a president, Xi Jinping, made a very important statement. In fact, last week I had a long uh, meeting, video meeting with the, I think also one of your uh, 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 colleagues, Minister Xi Xianhua, the former climate change advisor. We talk about uh, you as well. Uh, so how do you, because China is today the, by far the largest emitter of the world, about 30% of the uh, emissions globally come from uh, China. Uh, how do you, the significance of this um, uh, uh, announcement of President Xi Jinping, how do you assess this uh, from your perspective? Well, I think it is of huge importance uh, that China at the highest level uh, made this strong commitment. And I have to say, you know that there are many issues where we disagree with China and, and even have some very, very tough talks uh, um, on trade, on, on, on human rights, etc. Uh, but on this issue, the conversation we've had with China and having with China is extremely constructive. And I have to say, um, you know, there's now work being done uh, to translate uh, the commitment uh, Xi Jinping made uh, uh, in the UN into the five year plan and what this would mean for coal fired power stations, for uh, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, we, are, we stand ready. Uh, to look into this with our uh, Chinese partners and to see how we can cooperate in making these things happen. And I have to say, the attitude is very constructive. Um, uh, of course, we have to wait what this means concretely, but I am optimistic because, you know, it's it's just like we are doing. It's, it's just calculating what the costs are of the transformation and then uh, comparing that with the cost of not acting, and then and then you come quickly to the conclusion that although the cost is going to be really high and it's going to be tremendously difficult to get it done, it's still much better than to not do it because then the consequences are huge. And and I, I'm sure that the Chinese are making this analysis also for their internal situation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans. Now, one question from uh, the uh, media, uh, Mrs. Bedini. What do you think is the role of state aid enabling the Green Deal and how does it intertwine with uh, regulation? Well, we, we will maintain the rules uh, for state aid in the sense that we want to make sure we have a level playing field in the European Union. Uh, because it is clear, you know, one of the reasons we had uh, this huge package in July was to sh was to show that everybody understands that member states are not all in the same position. Uh, some member states have a, a lot more fiscal capacity to act and to support their industry and to help them come out of this crisis than other member states. So we need to make sure 
for the sake of the internal market and for the sake of Europe's economy, that everybody has the same opportunity to come out of this crisis. This is how we will be uh, 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 viewing a state aid. The rules are clear. We've made also clear that now we need to invest and, and that will also have to happen with public money into our recovery. And we've also made clear to member states when they submit their recovery plans uh, that none of the money should go into a direction that it goes counter to what we want to achieve with the Green, uh, green Deal. And if you take um, Next Generation EU, which is a recovery plan, and you put it together with uh, the uh, budget plans for the next seven years, 30% of everything that will be spent will have to go in uh, in a climate policy. So this gives a huge boost to this transformational agenda, and it also puts um, state aid in, in a perspective that would reinforce the internal market and not weaken it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans. Now, uh, there is uh, one... Uh, topic, I think, which will be discussed a lot in the next uh, months uh, to come, the uh, carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. How do you see the prospects and the, uh, the, the way how we should frame and discuss uh, this topic and what are your expectations, how we should uh, go forward uh, with them? Well, my, my starting position is, is the following. If you look at everyone who has subscribed to the Paris Agreement, um, then you could expect for those who have signed the Paris Agreement to also show what their plans are to get what we need to get. That's what Europe is doing. You know, everything we're doing is based on our analysis. How could we be uh, climate neutral by 2050? Because we believe we have a bigger responsibility than especially uh, 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 countries that are still industrializing. What does this mean for 2030, et cetera, et cetera? And we can ask that also of our partners in the Paris Agreement. Now, if partners choose not to do that, and we do that, of course, we put an extra burden on European industry. And if we're not careful, this will lead to carbon leakage. They will leave Europe or they will be in a disadvantageous situation in terms of the competition with um, their competitors outside the European Union. If that is the case, uh, because of others not taking the measures they need to take, then we will protect our industry uh, by introducing carbon border adjustment mechanism. And we're working on that, looking sector by sector. It's not going to be a sort of a, a blanket uh, thing. It's going to be focused sector by sector. And uh, we're in the middle of this analysis. And somewhere early next year, we probably will be able uh, to show some results there. And, and then we will have to take decisions. But if other nations... You know, you, you, you talked about this wonderful announcement by, by the Japanese prime minister as well. Uh, we've talked earlier about what Xi Jinping said. Let's see what happens in the United States over the next couple of months. If other nations take measures going into the same direction, then, of course, the need for carbon border adjustment mechanism will be more limited than if other nations don't take the, the measures in that direction. Uh, excellent. This boats very well with the next question coming uh, from the uh, journalist Yannick Rock from SNP. How important is it to get the U.S. back on board when it comes to global climate uh, action? Well, um, you know, the, the thing is, we, we've shown, um, I think Europe has shown leadership and others have followed. Uh, I mentioned China, I mentioned Japan, I could have mentioned Canada, I could have mentioned South Africa, which also made an incredibly... Uh, audacious uh, announcement uh, not so long ago. Uh, you see countries all over Africa uh, moving in that direction. You see many Asian countries, you know, Indonesia and other Asian countries uh, uh, taking, uh, well, bold steps forward. But it would just make such a difference if also the United States uh, would be on board for bold uh, measures. Now, the picture in the United States is is always a bit bit more complex than just black and white because um, uh, we've been working very closely with the states, uh, with uh, 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 cities and with corporate America, who all seem to be heading in the same same uh, uh, direction as, as we do. Um, but of course, it would make a, a huge difference if, if uh, uh, an American administration would commit uh, to uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, because it would also, you know, like European leadership has an influence of others, but American leadership will also have an influence on others. Uh, worldwide. And if, if if the global players in the world would all be on the same page, that would make a huge difference, of course. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Timamas. One big challenge, uh, there are many, many challenges, of course, uh, when it comes to the climate change and the uh, uh, putting the right energy policies in places. 
uh, several people who really believe the immediate uh, uh, action to address climate change thinks that I need this tech, I like this clean technology, but I don't like the other clean uh, uh, technology. They are a bit of a picky thing. And uh, one of the uh, uh, statements you made recently, which I really uh, enjoyed very much reading, is the critical importance of carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So, uh, what are your views? Why do you think, uh, uh, Mr. Timamas, CCUS is an uh, important uh, uh, option here? Well, you know, this is a very controversial issue. Uh, but I'm, first of all, the, the Commission is uh, has a position of technological neutrality. It, what works, works. Uh, and we, we, we don't have sort of a predisposition for one or the other. What works, works, and what works best and cheapest is best. Um, and I believe that in, 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 in quite a number of areas um, uh, where the transition is huge, just imagine your energy mix is 80% coal, um, just as a, an illustration. Natural gas will play the role of a transitional uh, uh, fuel because natural gas already has a much smaller emissions blueprint uh, than a uh, footprint, sorry, than uh, uh, um, uh, wood or coal. So it, it is in the nature of things that natural gas will have this transitional uh, uh, value. To decarbonize natural gas is, te technologically speaking, easier. Uh, then while we started with CCS, which was to decarbonize coal, which is much more complicated, as, as you know, better than anybody else. So decarbonized natural gas uh, is also a way to get us to blended fuels, to get us to um, uh, carbon uh, neutral fuels, etc., which in some difficult to abate areas will be necessary. I was just talking about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, housing, housing. Uh, uh, heated by by wood or coal to go immediately to to renewables is, might be too challenging. But if you could use natural gas and decarbonize natural gas as an intermediary, that would already be helpful. And then, of course, we have difficult to abate sectors. Um, uh, you know that Airbus is now developing uh, three prototypes that would run on hydrogen. Um, the airline industry will not be electrified. It will have to have other uh, sources. And, and, and also there, I believe, uh, synthetic fuels, um, blended fuels, uh, also in shipping, might play uh, an important uh, role. And hydrogen will play a hugely crucial role in our energy mix of the future. I mean, I'm just so much looking forward to steel being produced with hydrogen. Just imagine how this will change uh, some of our assumptions if you could do that. Uh, but um, we need to build up uh, the uh, electrolyzing of hydrogen very quickly. Of course, we want green hydrogen, but in the intermediary, blue hydrogen will also play a certain role in this. And for this, we need CCS. Um, and of course, the technologies are being developed, especially if you're a coastal country. CCS uh, might be um, uh, an interesting proposition because the storage of the carbon, uh, um, which can be uh, solidified in 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 certain uh, um, uh, marine areas under uh, deeply uh, under the the seabed uh, makes it an interesting proposition. Well, I could talk for this uh, about this for hours. I'll stop here because I've, my answer is already too long. <laughs> no, it is very very good. And you, uh, uh, Mr. Timamas, one thing with you is that it is very nice that such a complex issue you uh, say in a very simple way. In fact. Um, when we met, I told you, I don't know if you remember, Johan Cruyff is one of my uh, legend uh, uh, philosophers, I should say, in the football player. He once said, I tell my colleagues in the communication office here all the time, Johan Cruyff said, uh, football is a, a simple game, but it is very difficult to play simple. So uh, it, we have to simplify the things that everybody can understand and have an access to. So thank you very much for that. But now going to another difficult issue after CCS, a very good uh, point you have uh, mentioned. Now, we have, as you said, uh, 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 very uh, uh, rightly, we have crowned solar is the new king of electricity. So it's growing very strongly in Europe. Wind is growing very strongly, will grow very strongly, offshore and onshore wind. But uh, today, if you put all of them together, solar and wind, their share in the European electricity generation is about uh, close to 15%. Now, you have a, another zero 
emission technology, which is nuclear power, which is about 27 percent. So what are your thoughts about the existing uh, nuclear fleet and also a, a, a possible uh, new additions? What are your uh, thoughts uh, on that, uh, Mr. Timmermans, on nuclear? Well, again, I have to repeat that, you know, in terms of the technology used, the commission is neutral. Um, so if countries, after assessing, come to the conclusion that they want to use nuclear energy, the huge advantage, of course, of it is that it's emission uh, free. It, of course, also has, uh, in my view, two serious disadvantages. Um, first being that you need fuel for it and that you're left with uh, waste that needs to be treated, which, as you know, uh, remains a very complicated issue, although we are making technological uh, advances in this. Uh, by the way, uh, not that much technological advances have been made in nuclear energy over the last years. There's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, less investment in this than before, but okay, that's another issue. Uh, then the second disadvantage I need to mention is that you know, it is very expensive. It is very, very expensive. And, and if you invest in it, you're stuck with it for a very, very long period of time. Um, and um, given the fact that, that both solar and wind are coming down in, in price so quickly, as you know very well, and that, uh, uh, then I just hope, I just hope countries who need to decide do it in a completely rational way. Just look at it with without passion, just dispassionate, rational. Do the numbers and then draw your conclusions. Uh, that's my only my only plea. Because uh, you know, if you commit to nuclear energy, if you don't have it yet and you want to go into it, or if you've gone out and want to come back in, be aware of the massive, massive level of investments uh, you will need. And be aware of the cost, uh, the the um, uh, cost uh, for life cycle of that, which means that you will be stuck with it for a long, long, long time. Um, but if you come to the conclusion that is your best option, uh, the Commission will certainly not stand in your way. And we will try and uh, give some impetus to research in this area. Uh, you know that we are researching nuclear fusion and the research on nuclear fusion also has some spin offs that could be useful in the uh, uh, in the uh, atomic energy uh, era. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Timmermans. At the IEA, we are very keen to make use of all clean energy technologies available and the ones who are going to be hopefully available soon, uh, like the ones you have mentioned, including uh, hydrogen. Another uh, question from the uh, press. You mentioned the importance of decarbonizing uh, transport. This is critical. But uh, the sales of the EVs, electric cars, are much less than the SUVs. How to revert this trend uh, in uh, Europe? Well, I think we, we, uh, we will have to um, look at our emission uh, legislation uh, to stimulate uh, the production of electric uh, uh, vehicles, um, because the bigger the production is, uh, the lower the price per unit will be. And we need to make sure that EVs become uh, accessible for people with normal incomes and not just for people who can spend a, a lot of money on their cars. Um, so that, that is the first thing. For that, we also need to create the right charging infrastructure, which is not there, and we will be massively investing in, in, in that as well. But I also see uh, changing trends. You know, the, the, we need to be able to accommodate uh, people's transportation needs in a more modern way. Um, you know, if, if you just, just one comparison, if you talk to people in the airline industry uh, uh, and, and, and you tell them, uh, uh, you know, you have an airplane and it sits on the tarmac uh, for 20 hours or even more a day and then you use it for a couple of hours a day, they would say, that's crazy. You can never make it profitable like that. But many people with their private cars are in that situation uh, and simply because they need them. They, they have no alternative. Now, I think the, the automotive industry will be developing more and more in the direction of a service oriented industry. We provide your transportation and you just you have an app on your phone and you ask for the transportation you need and it will be uh, 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 at your dis uh, disposal immediately. And this co this combines uh, private transport with public transport. We need to uh, upgrade public transport. We need to decarbonize public transport. Most municipalities across the European Union want to move very quickly on that, which I which I applaud. Um, and we need to, you know, change our thinking uh, on how uh, we uh, accommodate our transportation uh, needs. But at the same time, you know, we also have to be very realistic. 
uh, and this uh, lesson was learned uh, very clearly with the yellow vests in France, that for many people, uh, the car they have, uh, which they can hardly afford or which is difficult for them to pay for, is essential for them to have their job. Uh, if, they, if, they, if you don't live in a, in a big city and you can't uh, use public transport, the car is, is of essential importance. And if, if you don't take that into the equation, you will lose the public support you need to make uh, this uh, paradigm shift in the way we move. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Timamas. We have uh, less than 10 minutes left, and we have a few questions. And I can tell you, my colleagues told me, uh, thanks to you, uh, Mr. Timamas, thousands of people uh, following this uh, uh, discussion. Now, thank you very much for giving this uh, Anna. Now, the journalist uh, Anna Gumba from Carbon Pass, uh, she is asking, uh, how do we assess the plans for coal phase out from EU member uh, states? Well, you know, if you, if you just go back a couple, I I, I did a, um, I, w I went on a visit, uh, not so long ago. I think it's now two and a half, three years ago. I don't know exactly how long ago, not that long ago, um, to a, a, a place in Germany where they still have coal production and uh, where they uh, have very traditional coal production, like the place I'm from in the Netherlands. My my granddads were both uh, coal miners, um, and I sat there. Um, we will have to phase out of coal. There's no future in coal. And there was a huge uproar. There was a huge uproar. This is only two or two and a half years ago. You know, the things are moving so fast. Nobody in Europe sees any future in coal anymore, long term. And all countries that still depend on coal have now made plans to phase out of coal. It's Germany. It's also Poland now. The Czech Republic is thinking uh, about it. Uh, Greece is moving at lightning speed. Uh, they're moving out of lignite in a couple of years time, which is which shows incredible leadership. Um, so the phase out plans are there. My personal assumption is that that these phase out plans are made on the basis of what we know today. And if we've moved so fast in the last couple of years, I tr just tried to tell you my personal experience. I don't know where we will be in two or three years time. So I think the the phase out plans as they are today are made on the basis of what we know today. And they might change in a couple of years' time. I don't think the phase-out plans will be moved towards the future. I think they will be moved towards uh, more towards the present in the future. But that's not for me to to be sure about because you know things are moving so fast. Let's wait. But for now, the fact that there are phase-out plans or almost phase phase-out plans, I think is good news because it sort of acknowledges across the European Union that there is no future in coal. I think this is uh, very important what will happen in the uh, coal phase out in Europe for the rest of the uh, world, because as we know, half of the coal plants in the world alone is in China. So what will China decide? And uh, uh, because uh, one of the things uh, what we have found out, uh, Mr. Timmermans, is that even if we build everything uh, new, clean and green, zero emissions, as long as we don't address the existing power plants, iron steel plants, and uh, all of them, we have no chance to reach our climate target. So we have two jobs, to build the uh, new ones clean, and the uh, second, to improve that, clean up the existing infrastructure, and therefore uh, coal uh, plants, especially those inefficient coal plants in uh, uh, developing Asia, uh, is uh, very important. So I, I have a last uh, three questions. Uh, the last two are very easy, but this one is also, I think, very important. You mentioned the just transition. I mean, just transition, you in fact alluded in the context of uh, Europe, which is well understood, and I think very touchy and important subject, but also just transition for the world. I am sure you can agree with me, and I know you have a very soft spot in your heart for Africa. We cannot put uh, Sweden or Netherlands and the others in the same basket like uh, Africa today. Just to give you one uh, one number, uh, which impresses me a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans, the entire sub-Saharan Africa, how much solar energy they got, I mean, think about it, and how big it is, the amount of solar power capacity in entire sub-Saharan Africa is five gigawatts equal to Netherlands alone. Netherlands has five gigawatts solar, and the entire Africa has five gigawatts. So uh, what does just transition 
mean for me in the context of the developing nations, especially those least developed ones, including the sub-Saharan Africa? Well, I think we as, as industrialized world, um, the richest part of the world, we have until the Glasgow COP to demonstrate, especially to those uh, countries in Africa, and, uh, think about the countries in the Pacific, that we are, that we mean business, not just in terms of our own policies, but also in terms of our support for adaptation and mitigation, but also our support for bringing energy to parts of the world that don't have energy, and then perhaps leapfrogging over a number of developments so that you go immediately into clean energy. I have been inspired, truly inspired, by uh, the changes I've seen in Africa over the last year, year and a half, where many African leaders have now said, okay, um, uh, Europe and others, um, you know, be fair with us and help us adapt to this and help us mitigate the consequences. Look at the consequences for Africa, they're horrible. Um, you know, the locust uh, pl plagues they've faced and the, the erratic weather, the unpredictability of seasons, etc. These are huge challenges. They need to adapt, they need to mitigate the consequence, and we need to be on their sides for doing that. But at the same time, there is a huge potential market. You have all these very young, talented people. You have a huge demand for energy. Uh, the advantage of, of sustainable energy is solar and wind. It is It democratizes energy generation because you can have energy generation at a very small scale, at the scale of a village. And at the same time, you create enough energy for growth in those villages and et cetera, et cetera. So the, the thing is, we need to get that organized. And most African nations have uh, are now developing wonderful plans for this. These are not plans made by us. They make them themselves. And we need to support them in uh, uh, creating uh, a success for that. And I, I believe, you know, just the, the potential for solar energy generation that could then also be uh, used to create to 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 create uh, green hydrogen is 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 incredible, and then it it, it would uh, supply a Africa with the energy needs uh, which are exploding these needs that they they have. It would provide for economic uh, opportunity, and it would also uh, handle another issue that will remain a very political and topical issue in Europe, which is the issue of migration. Uh, you know, so so everything ties into each other here, and and of course, from a European perspective, Africa is 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 the the continent, it's our sister continent. We think most about, and we should be working most with. Uh, but this is also a global phenomenon, and I don't see why we could not have the same discussion with countries in Asia, etc. Thank you very much uh, for this answer uh, as well, Mr. Tremans. So, uh, last two questions. Uh, Mr. Tremas, moving from energy and climate to uh, uh, another very important uh, topic. Uh, why Roma? Why did you choose to support uh, Roma? Uh, so where does it come from? So as you are a, a Dutch man, a, a Dutch politician, and then you're in Brussels. How come uh, uh, Roma? Well, as a teenager, I lived in Rome for four years. And, wow. and with the friends I had there, with my Italian friends, I spent a lot of time in the streets and... Uh, with my Italian friends, they used to take me uh, to the Roma games on Sundays. At the time, games were always on Sundays, as you know. San Siro. You went to San Siro then? No, no, no. It's, it's the Stadio Olimpico. The Stadio oh, Olimpico in Rome. And, and um, I didn't have the money for, for tickets. And, and they always got me in. Uh, at the time, you know, you, you were with a group of friends and they would take care of you. And, and I remember the feeling of belonging, of friendship, and, and this incredible... Uh, you know, this incredible feeling of of, of uh, being fan of a club that is so much linked to, to to the city of Rome. And of course, the competition with Lazio, etc. and all of that. And in those years, Rome was not the, the best club in Italy. It was sometimes even struggling. Uh, but that doesn't make that doesn't make a difference. You know, if it's your club, regardless where it stands, you support it. And, you know, this has been going on now for me. I'm, I'm now 50, 59 years of age. It's been going on for um, for 45 years, so it's never going to change. And are you following in the TV the, the matches? For example, are, tonight they play against Milan, if I'm not wrong. In San yeah, City. I, I follow that. You know, I, I, I you can you can you can take out uh, uh, you know one of those channels where you can follow yes. all these matches, and I have all of them online or on TV here. Uh, no, no, I I, I follow football uh, with with a great passion. Wonderful. 
uh, thank you very much. My last question, uh, uh, this time being on the selfish side, uh, you are a very uh, experienced uh, 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 political uh, uh, figure, and you have a, you are keeping an eye on the uh, global issues, focusing on Europe. And we at the IEA, uh, we are keen, we are determined to lead the global clean energy transitions around the world, working with all the countries around the world. If you were to, as the last question, if you were to give me, as head of the IEA, brief advice, what to do or what not to do, uh, 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 Mr. Timmermans, what, what would be your advice to me? Well, Dr. Birol, the last thing you need is my advice. Uh, uh, you, you're doing such a such a brilliant job, and uh, I think I think what 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 I you know the thing is that you've given the uh, energy agency a completely different um, uh, image uh, uh, during uh, your tenure. Um, you know, it's not it's not just the fossil fuel promoting. Uh, which, which in the past was sort of the the image the 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 agency got, and now you are part of shaping the industrial revolution and of helping us recover from this. And it, this would be, you know, in all modesty, my advice. Everybody's waiting for answers. How do we shape the future? And the sh the only future we can shape that we can you know, with 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 uh, honesty, give to our children and grandchildren is a decarbonized future because that's the only way we can prevent catastrophe in the climate crisis we're in. And and your agency is has a crucial role to play because anybody who's engaged in energy knows this needs to happen, but not everybody is yet on board. And your leadership will help get them on board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Timmermans. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have thousands of colleagues uh, following this, uh, I think, very interesting view, uh, discussion and wonderful views of uh, Mr. Timmermans. As I told you, uh, Mr. Timmermans is the executive vice president of the uh, uh, European uh, Commission. European uh, is the leader of the European Green Deal. He's the thinker, brain, architect, and the guardian. Of course, every country around the world is it is own. Uh, uh, conditions, own context, but I am sure that the European Green Deal is a very important source of inspiration. Thanks to Mr. Timamas, to uh, all of us. Once again, Mr. Timamas, thank you very much for uh, joining us and uh, uh, good luck for the week and good luck for tonight against uh, Milan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.